what's going on everybody? It's John Schnapp here. It's episode 73 of Collider Heroes. And we've got an action-packed show. Let me get right into it. Let's start off over in the corner over here. We've got Robert Meyer Burnett. Hello there. It's great to be here. Happy uh, post-Labor Day to all of you. I know, right? Everybody had a good time. I had a good time. I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, rocking the Salt Lake City Comic Con. All the Utah sweaties who came out, Collider fans, Heroes fans, I want to say thank you for being so cool. Uh, we've got Chris Gore over here, the return of Chris Gore. What's up, man? How's it going? I just got back from Dragon Con in Atlanta, which right? is, oh my God, it's like Nerdy Gras. That's yeah. what I call it because it's it's everyone partying, everybody uh, cosplaying, and I cosplayed as Mr. Fantastic. I saw that. And there are That's stretchy photos of me online. You can follow on my. That's Twitter. one of your famous outfits. It was fun because yeah. while I was at Salt Lake, I'd check in and I'd check in on all the people who are over at Dragon <laughs> Con. Yeah. It was fun to be like, oh, there's that other con. There's so many cons going on. Speaking of cons, we've got the lovely Ashley V. Robinson in the house. What's up? Not much. I spent all my weekend being confused by why you guys don't spell Labor Day with a U. <laughs> So. We also don't spell color with a U either. No, you're I, not honoring those French traditions. I know. But we, right? we do spell about <laughs> a boot. with a U. Yeah, a boot. A boot. A, boot. a boot. a boot has a U. You got to go really east for that. Well, so. hey, I just also, before we get right into the show, I wanted to pimp a couple of cool things that are coming up. Uh, Long Beach Comic Con is September 17th and 18th, and we have a Heroes panel, which I've been doing at a lot of Comic Cons. I started doing a Collider Heroes live panel, which is basically any of uh, the normal panelists who happen to be at the convention, and uh, I'll handpick a couple of comic book artists and writers, and we'll do a, a live panel. We'll talk about news of the week, and then we throw it out to you guys and do an extended Q&A. You might hear some hammering a little bit. There's guys up on the roof fixing our roof. So we're going to have an extended special uh, uh, audio interruption episode. Isn't that right, guys? Uh, I don't know. If, or, or we'll get uh, Superman to come and fly and take them off the roof, perhaps. That probably won't happen. Anyway, Long Beach Comic Con, September 17th and 18th. We've got a panel there. And then at New York Comic Con, we have a panel on Thursday, the very first day of New York Comic Con. It's at, I think it's at 10 in the morning. So get there early. Ooh for an extra early, tasty, crunchy episode of Heroes in New York. And I believe Ashley is going to be there, right? I'm going to be at both. She's so. going to be at both. Robert, you're going to be there? Yep, I'll be at both, too. And Gore, are you going to be at both? I, I'm going to be at Long Beach. All right, Long Gone. Beach for but sure. I'm not, then, not going to New York. Gore's going to be on there. So just want to get you guys uh, all ready for uh, both the East Coast and the West Coast Heroes appearances. And now let's start the episode. Um, we have got first news is the shocker is in Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, a lot of us have heard about this. Uh, the third villain's been teased that it would be Bokeem Woodbine, and it looks like he will indeed be playing the shocker because um, that just looks like his head is inside of that. I, I know Wo Bokeem <laughs> Woodbine's perfect shaved egg head, and it looks like it's simply inside of that mask. Um, this character has been part of uh, Spider-Man's rogues gallery since the 60s, and true to the MCU, uh, this shocker looks pretty authentic, mixing the old school with the new as far as the costumes. What about what do you guys think about the addition of the shocker, which is now including the vulture and the tinker? So we've got three villains. Are there any more villains that are going to be popping up? Let's start with Chris. What are your thoughts about the shocker? Uh, first of all, I, I think it's great that the shocker is in it. Rob told me a completely different definition of the term shocker before we mm. started the show, which was strange. But I know I've heard but, about that version. But 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 uh, no, I love the idea that they've got these classic characters and the great part of that what the MCU does so well in these Marvel movies is update the costumes so they honor the old you know what 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 we saw in the comic but it's not a direct translation it's actually a practical translation of the costume I think I, I'm just curious like how Spider-Man uh, is going to balance all of these villains I, I'm really excited about Michael Keaton which I share a birthday with no, September right 5th Congratulations. Uh, thank you for that uh, but my, Michael Keaton who of course we saw in Birdman um, I mean, he's kind of, in a way, already dressed like the Vulture. That's mm -hmm. like, like if you look at the Birdman costume, it's kind of a really cool yeah. costume for the Vulture. Yeah. It's kind of birdish. Yeah, it's kind of birdish. So I'm really curious to see like how Spider-Man is going to balance all of these villains. Are there going to be some secret villains they're going to tease? What the what the, what the sort of post-credit sequence is going to be, or maybe post-credit sequences? Mm -hmm. uh, but the Shocker looks cool. Like, and and I just can't wait for this because. I, I just rewatched Civil War on, right. on the flight to Dragon Con, and wow, is Spider Man good in that movie? Right? He's so good. Those like good. 15 or 18 minutes that he's in are just awesome. Yeah. It's a great it, introduction. It's incredible just how great the new Peter Parker is, the fact that there's a hot Aunt May. Right. 
it's just I'm 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 just super excited. So well, uh, yay for the shocker. Let's go, Ashley. What are your thoughts on the shocker? I really like that they've clearly taken a design note from the Reverse Flash on the Flash television show. I think that's very funny. <laughs> right. um, I'm really hoping that since we're introducing some of these. Not disrespectfully, but like lower tier Spider-Man characters sure. that we know that we have uh, Donald Glover in this movie. I'm really right. hoping that the Jackal thing is going to come true because I think that that would set up the miles of it all. That totally. again is all just speculation, really nicely. But I like that we're not retreading any old villains in this, or we're not touching on any of them because I think that was a lot of the problem with the Mark Webb Andrew Garfield adaptation. Was like, well, we had a really great Green Goblin. Why are we going to do a Troll 2 version of Green right. Goblin? <laughs> totally. But this looks great. How about you, Robert? Well, you know, I feel the same way that, that you do about the costume because the fact that it's utilitarian, the way they made Captain America his World War II outfit in the first Avenger. Blue jeans. It yeah. well, looked, before even after that, It looked he had a, a utilitarian, it still looked like Captain America, identifiably so, but it was also like, I believed he'd go into battle mm. with yeah. that. And the shocker looks like... He's, he's a villain on the local level. He's yeah. clearly not interested in world domination. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I think that's important for the Marvel Universe because Spider-Man is not always you know, looking out for world-conquering villains. He's a local level celebrity and superhero, yeah. so why wouldn't he spend time in his own neighborhood with a villain who clearly looks like that? I think the Shocker is going to be used as an introduction of starting of the film because... He's gonna probably he probably got his shocking device the concussion. A lot of people were like, "Hey, it's not electricity; it's concussion." It's the power of the shocking concussion powers that he has. I bet he got that from the Tinkerer, and I think that's how we're gonna introduce oh, the Tinkerer, cool. who works at Stark, you know, Stark Labs, and also is building that Vulture outfit. But I think the the Shocker is gonna be like an introductory villain to introducing us to the new Spider-Man and a cool action sequence, and he's not gonna be a big part of the plot. That's my guess. Um, but I think he looks really cool. I love that we we have that like you know that that original shocker kind of look, but it's updated. It's a new school. So anyway, I think the shocker is going to be awesome, but not a, not a big part of the plot. And I think we'll see a bunch of other villains, but not too much. I think they'll be woven in pretty well. So let's move on. We've got too many Supermans, or are there not enough Supermans? <laughs> let's talk about Superman, 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 Superman. We've known about Superman appearing in several episodes of the CW series Super. Girl, and now a new official pick has dropped featuring Tyler Hoechlin as the Man of Steel, standing next to his cousin Melissa bon Benoist's Supergirl. What does this mean for the CW universe, and is this the soft launch for an actual new series simply titled Superman? Can this actually be happening, and does this diminish the role for the big screen's Henry Cavill? How many Supermans can we take? Let's start with you, Robert. Well, I don't think there can ever be enough Superman, but I and I think if there ever ever is going to be a CW show, it's going to be called The Adventures of Superman. Mm -hmm. It's not just going to be Superman, right? Because like Legends of Tomorrow, you've got to give Superman gravitas in his title. But I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think the jury's still out. Let's see what he looks like. What does he look like on camera? He kind of looks like an Italian dude cosplay right now, <laughs> right? And, and I, I mean, I, but I think he looks good. I, but I just I want to see him in motion. Sure. I mean, the producers. I always trust in the producers. They know. What about you, Chris? Uh, I don't know. I, 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 the costume is actually reminiscent of, we were talking before the show, uh, of Man of Steel, mm -hmm. the Henry Cavill Superman costume. It's the sans the red underwear, which you guys can't see this, but we're actually in tribute. We're all wearing red underwear. Right now, you can see I've got the red Yeah. Red Chris shorts just really on. wanted. Chris just really wanted to show off his shorts. We are all wearing red underwear. Yeah, right now, but he just wanted right for here. some reason wanted to just but rock it. But then it's it. like the Injustice Gods Among Us. He's got that kind of sort of yeah. cape going mm -hmm. on from from the games, the video games. So I I, don't, I I feel like you know we need to see him in action. I'd love to see a spinoff series because I think part of the problem with Batman v Superman because um, I've watched that ultimate cut. It's like they took a season's worth of story material and shoved it into a three hour recap. Right. It felt like, because there was so much story, 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 story. And, 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 and so I'd love to see a, a, an Adventures of Superman show. I'd love to see actually time given. I'd love to see Superman done. I'd like to see a Superman movie where, or a Superman TV show where he's actually the essence of the character. I'm not sure that Cavill's really captured it yet. And I think that that's due mostly to the writing.
writing. It's not Cavill's performance. Well, I mean, in Man of Steel, he was Superman for one day, and then you know he had to fight Kryptonians, and then in Batman v Superman, he's discovering who Batman is, and then dies. So it's sort of there's not <laughs> yeah. a lot in brooding, a lot of brooding, and seeing a lot of people on is TV, with you? a lot of people on TV talking mad hate about him, and he's like, "What the hell? I'm saving people. What's going?" So I felt like they didn't show enough of the people in Metropolis. Obviously, there's a, a tribute statue memoriam for him and a lot of people in metropolis and the world love superman they just didn't show it enough in the film and so you had a kind of a brooding like picked on superman who then uh, sacrifices himself once again for the entire planet so saving not only did he save the entire world in man of in man of steel with a lot of the uh, casualties in metropolis but then saves the entire world again and dies in, in batman but we, get a, but we get a montage in place of what should have been a bunch of scenes we yes. should have seen the emotional impact of him saving the girl in mexico as opposed to just him coming down from the sky with her because that is such a plot point to get him away from the party and, and, and to distract Wonder Woman and Batman in the first place. Totally. Yeah, yeah. But I just have a pro I, I'd like to see a Superman show that's hopeful, mm -hmm. that's fun. I want to see Superman save kittens from trees. Right. You know, no, seriously, I think that's what was missed. That's what's missing from the. Here we are talking about the Snyder Batman v Superman yet again. <laughs> it's not just because I'm here, but like, but because there could be another incarnation of Superman, it really can be different. If, if anything, to me, the best Superman that we've seen is Captain America. Right. If you look in the in the Marvel universe, Captain America, he's a boy scout, he's good at heart, he's sort of out of time and disconnected from everyone, and he's th the most true uh, in spirit in heart and I feel like the best Superman is named Captain America. Right now there is. Right now well, there is. Also, yeah. we're getting a Krypton TV series. Yeah. Supposedly yeah. though, cuz that's been in Well, they they started casting for, it. Though. Oh, have they finally? Yeah, they the, started casting wow. the, the all Zan right, family. All right, Goyer, I the retract right. my comment. Yeah. No, and it, it's like such a weird so and that that's going to be on, like, is it Netflix or, or is it HBO? So you're going on to yet another network? So so DC is spread over Fox, the Sci-Fi Channel, and the CW? Yes. You know, and we're going to see, like, <laughs> how... Cartoon Network? <laughs> yeah. Right, I mean, how do, you, how do you sort of reconcile all these different... I mean, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm happy that we're getting all of these things, but <laughs> it's very odd that they should all have some kind of through line, maybe, but I they think don't. I think it is odd, but I'm excited that, I like what you're calling it the adventures of Superman. I think hopefully we'll see a spinoff, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to soft introduce Superman into the CW universe. They already have a successful show, Supergirl. I think it's a smart move, and let's see how this Superman is. We'll find out in a couple weeks. It's literally, I think it's like October 2nd or 10th when the series starts. Yeah, they all the start off that, that first week. I think yeah. the question of whether or not it diminishes Super Henry Cavill Superman is an interesting question because for me, it more diminishes Melissa Benoit's Supergirl because mm -hmm. in the first season, he didn't even show up and he saved her three times. And I don't know what the feminine version of emasculate is. I think it's just being a girl in the world, but <laughs> uh, he's, he does that to her without even showing up. And now that you're gonna have him on set next to her, I think that is, well, I like I like Tyler Hecklin. I like I like Teen Wolf. Um, I think that that could maybe be bad for a show that is called Supergirl. And if you were going to spin out a Superman show, I would rather see like a 1990s casting. Like bring me Steel, bring me mm. uh, Superboy, like John Henry Irons. Like let's see more than just you know. Boy Scout, gen not generic, but like the Superman that we all know from the animated series. Well, I but I like that they introduced Superman in Supergirl because they had to establish mm -hmm. that that in the comics it's the sa same legend. She's she's the younger cousin of him. I just think he didn't need to fly in because Jimmy called him on his watch, right. like off off panel basically sure. in the Man of Steel suit, and then she wakes up and she's like, "I guess Superman saved the day." Well, they were doing <laughs> that. I, I know they did it because they hadn't cast a Superman, yeah, yeah, but I don't yeah, yeah, think yeah. it's going to diminish Supergirl. I think it's going to make her sh her series stronger. I really hope. So. I mean, I think because remember, he's guest starring in her series. It's like, Superman, you don't even have a show yet. What's up? So <laughs> anyway, yeah. we'll find out very soon. Let's move on. We got Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy talking about Hush and Death in the Family animated style. So at Canada's Fan Expo, yet another convention that was happening this past weekend, Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy, the iconic Joker and Batman most people associate with the animated voiceovers, kind of threw some titles back and forth to each other while on stage, mentioning both Hush and A Death in the Family. These are two of the bigger and well, most well-known story arcs from Batman's comic book runs, uh, both featuring Jason Todd. The Killing Joke was a smash, smash animated success for DC and with now with DC doing more more films like Justice League Dark and the Teen Titans Judas contract, which I personally and I know Robert cannot oh. wait to see. That is such an, an amazing 
uh, comic book run, Marv Wolf and George Perez got to throw out some shout outs. Will they keep pushing the library and adapting more and more and more of the great runs from DC's incredible comic run? Let's start with you, Ashley. What do you think? I really, really hope so because my favorite DC animated movie is uh, Under the Red Hood. Mm. And I think it is one of the best adaptations we've ever had of Jason Todd, who's kind of a difficult character because you want to dislike him but be empathetic at the same time. And it starts with like a two minute scene that is lifted directly from Death in the Family. So I think if you literally just aped that style mm -hmm. or, or took that and just built it out more, I think that would be really great. And then Hush is just, it's so popular. I'm surprised it hasn't been adapted yet. Right. Uh, come on, Jim Lee, I know, I know you're involved in that. I know, like right? plug yourself. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when the actors say something and put it out there, if it gets enough buzz, then it'll happen. I would be more interested in seeing this than another like original script. Some of those have worked out okay, and right. then some of them have worked out less okay. Right on. <laughs> Robert, how about you? Well, I mean, it, it excites me if they do it well. I mean, I was mm -hmm. really, really looking forward to the killing joke. And as we all know, <laughs> I mean, I thought what they did with the story was good, but then the prologue with Batgirl, I didn't. Right. I really objected to it. Yeah. I mean, like, not just, oh, I didn't like that. I really objected to it when I was watching it. I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> Where did that thought begin to put that in there? Mm -hmm. And look, I love I love Hush. I love mm -hmm. the absolute edition of Hush. I think I've read it 20 times. It's a great series. The artwork's incredible. I love the storyline itself. Um, is what there I a like Hush Hot Toys figure? There is not. <laughs> there is not. There is not a Hush Hot Toys figure. I can't believe but Ashley had to be the one to bring up Hot <laughs> wow, Toys. Wow, let's just say it's the this first world. time. Yeah. Yes, nicely done. Thank you, thank there's you. A, there's a Hot Toys of the Batman Arkham figure. Ah, okay. so but, close. But, you know, there is not one of the Hush figures. Well, I personally hope they do adapt, uh, do an adaptation of Hush. And I think that's, you know, like I love The Dark Knight Returns, the two-part oh, so adaptation. And why was it so good? Because they gave it the time. They made it a two-parter and then eventually kind of sewed it together into one big, incredible, well-directed film by Jay Oliva, who's a great animation director over at DC. So, I mean, they when they get it right, they get it so right. Chris, what do you think about more adaptations? Uh, there can never be enough Batman in the world. That's that's <laughs> my opinion on, on that. But yeah, I'm also a big fan of that of the that Dark Knight Returns two part series. Yeah. I thought Peter Weller did a great job. Totally. As like an older grizzled Batman. Yeah. I mean, he, he it was great. So I don't know. And also the, the great thing is is I don't know why they're talking about you know oh Mark Hamill's not going to do the Joker anymore. Kevin the, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill they could be doing this forever. Yeah. I mean, literally like, for the rest it, of their lives. It yeah. doesn't matter. They could do it for another twenty years. I, I don't know. If you've seen Mark Hamill lately at cons and whatnot, but that guy is in shape. Yeah. I really hope that we see some badass Jedi Luke. We finally get to see Luke be a real Jedi totally. in Episode Eight. But but as for their voice acting, they could be doing this forever. I don't know. I don't know. Like do all of that. Do Death in the Family and Hush and everything. Like and more. And are we going to get a little bit of Death in the Family in the next or the Affleck? Standalone Batman. Film. Oh, I hope so. I, I mean, it, it certainly <laughs> looks so like we it might seems get like a little I bit of that. feel like we have to. I mean, because so many elements mm -hmm. and just like visual, uh, not even Easter eggs, but straight up like, hey, we're looking at the Robin suit yeah, with DC the Joker. Yeah, did I mean, confirm that that was Jason Todd's suit. So. Yeah, so I think right. we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of really cool things happen in the in, in, farther in animated world and in the DCEU. So let's move on to what I like to call minor mutations, where we're just going to talk about some news of the week and then pick some of these uh, and, and expand and talk more about him. Number one, we got Stan Lee. Is he going to be the Watcher? He's in every single Marvel film. How can this be explained? Simple. He's either the chameleon or he is the Watcher or he is like some a scroll. That's it. He's got to be a shapeshifter or he's going to be the Watcher like the all-seer kind of... I hope he's the Watcher. I don't want to see him be a scroll. Number two, we got Elle Fanning as Jean Grey in some early concept art from X-Men Apocalypse. They were thinking about perhaps casting her. Um, that wouldn't have been a bad idea. Idea. Number three, we've got Suicide Squad has beaten Man of Steel at the box office with $673 million. Looks like it's going to close out with $700 million worldwide. Number four, we've got Ghost Riders, Robbie Ray's revealed in S.H.I.E.L.D. That's right. He's riding non-bikes. He's in a car now, just like the comics. Uh, and we, Number five, we've got James Gunn and Vin Diesel's special Groot script. <laughs> is uh, discussed. I want to actually, I want to own the Groot special edition, the script where it's it's describing
saying in like you know our earthly dialogue all the I am Groot like the you know for Vin to, to get that proper inflection and intonation I love that they just him and Gunn have this special extra nerdy Groot script and I want it so I want to see it at least uh, number six John Favreau returns as Happy Hogan in Spider-Man Homecoming so I, my guess is he's going to be picking up Tom Holland to drive him to a secret meeting with Tony Stark something like that might be happening happy to see Happy Hogan uh, number seven we got Black Lightning series. It's being developed by Berlanti, the guy who owns all of DC's television, everything, and a married couple, Mara Brock and Salim Akil. Uh, and lastly, we've got a bloody fisted Danny Rand in a brand new pick from Netflix's Iron Fist. My God, I'm so excited about Luke Cage. I just, I just, I didn't even read the articles, but a bunch of uh, press has come out. Like mm -hmm. people have seen some, like the first seven episodes. They're like, it's the greatest Netflix series. I'm not reading anymore. Because <laughs> it's coming out. Uh, it's coming out and I want to enjoy it. I'm going to binge watch the hell out of that on a weekend. And we'll be talking about it. We might have to do a Heroes Binge Watch Festival about Luke Cage. And guess what? His pal Iron Fist. You, I mean, Power Man and Iron Fist, who could ever even think that we live in a world where we're seeing a series about these characters let's start off with you robert what pops off to you in this minor well, i just have to say just to keep the luke cage <laughs> I, I, i've been going back and you know every episode is named after a gang star mm -hmm. song and my my knowledge of gang star the the rap duo from new york uh was limited mm -hmm. and now i've become a <laughs> gang star aficionado nice. and nice. wow <laughs> They, they even have the best use of a Defender video game sound effect in any rap song I've ever heard. Nice. I mean, everything about Is this Gangstar, Defender or Stargate? Defender. Oh, wow. Not okay. Star, I'm, a, I'm a big... It, it was, I'm just double-checking. I, I, my, my game was Stargate, so... You know. oh, but I love Stargate, but Stargate was, of course, a sequel. Yes, it, it was. It was the New Testament to Defender's Old Testament. That's right. So I... I, I but, but anyway, I would go back and say, I'm Black Lightning. Yeah, I'm right? a huge Black Lightning fan. Yes. Huge Black Lightning fan, and if I could see a Black Lightning Luke Cage team up, that would be I know fantastic. it's cross universe. That, that, that amalgam but wow. crossover, though. I just love that, that and that uniform. I love Black Lightning. Black Lightning is created by Trevor Von Eden when he was 16 years old, and I got a chance to meet Trevor Von nice. Eden recently at one of the conventions and talk with him. What an incredibly talented man! So I'm very happy to see Black Lightning getting some love. How about you, Chris? What what pops off to you? I, I love John Favreau being happy in mm -hmm. in Spider Man just because also John Favreau really is responsible for mm -hmm. the Marvel Universe being su successful. If because if you look at it, there were a lot. We forget this, you know. We bag on DC a lot, right? right. But we forget that. Previous to the first Iron Man movie, there were a lot of bad Marvel films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot. A lot. <laughs> I mean, you know, I buy them on bootleg DVDs at conventions. I'm co we're covering one on today's episode yeah. later yeah. on. So. Oh my God. Yes, so, we are. Yeah, so, so there are a lot of bad. So when the first Iron Man with RDJ hit, I mean, that was so incredible. And John Favreau fought for Robert Downey Jr. to be in it. Mm -hmm. and, and then also, you know, making himself kind of a minor character from the comics. Like in there, I love that. That. I love him being in Spider-Man, and also he's he's listed as an executive producer oh, yeah. on, on uh, Civil War so. and Avengers: Infinity War. And Avengers, too. like he's he he definitely has brought something to the MCU, and I, I, I love the idea that that he's in it. So so that's awesome. I hope they reveal that Pepper left Tony to go date Happy, and they're married like in the comics. Bam. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> That'd be rough. Ooh. Anything else pop off to you as uh, far as this news? Vin Diesel looks like a giant baby in that. <laughs> picture of him, which I thought was hilarious. Um, and I just want to continue the Black Lightning love because if that is successful, not only is it great to have more representation, but he's like the Minister of Education, uh, which is really cool. Like, he's a very intelligent, erudite character. And if we could use that to bring some of the milestone characters mm. onto television, like some Rocket and some Static, sure. I think that could be a very exciting television show. I think that's going to be in the works, so let's hope that happens. Yes. Today's flashback, we're going flashing back to Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, 2000. 2007, the sequel to the Tim Story directed 2005 film, which did some okay box office with mixed response by the critics. This second film had the return of Ian Grufford. Uh, sorry if I'm going to ruin their names. Michael Yoan uh, Grufford, Michael Chiklis, Jessica Alba, and Chris Evans as the Human Torch, and as they're playing the first family, the Fantastic Four, along with the return of Julian McMahon as Doctor Doom, with the introduction of Doug Jones slash Lawrence Fishburne as the Silver Surfer, and a purple fart cloud as Galactus, <laughs> Eater of Planets. Uh, what uh, What is it about this incredible comic book series that the films constantly fail to get? These two films pander to the lowest comic
common denominator, treating the audience like children with a simplistic script and horribly unfunny bits that were supposed to be funny yet fall flat every time. And believe me, I've tried to watch it because I love the Fantastic Four. This movie sucks. Force is a word <laughs> that drips all over this misfire and it only gets worse. Elements from the original Stan Lee and Jack Kirby run are repeatedly burned alive and most comic book fans are left leaving the theaters with third degree burns. By the time the poop cloud enters the picture, <laughs> you're just waiting for someone to kill this movie or yourself. Let's talk about this failed Fantastic Four sequel and why no one has gotten it right even after four feature film attempts. I'm talking about the Corman one that no one's ever seen. I'm talking about these two poopy films and I'm talking about Tranks like a, you know, horror film version. All of them have failed to get the Fantastic Four and my personal feeling, because that's one of my favorite comics, one of the first comics I read outside of monster comic books was the Fantastic Four is because they are not understanding that it's a family mm -hmm. that goes on cosmic adventures. And that is just the, the simplest way you can do it is just read the first 65 issues of Fantastic Four and you get that feeling, you get, that, you get the fun interaction of the entire group Reed, Sue, Ben, and Johnny, and you get all their friends, and as they are introduced to this, to this incredible world of all these different characters, like every issue, there was a brand new character that you know and by name now that's in the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe. If you haven't heard of them yet, it's not just Doctor Doom, it's every single other character. Uh, they're failing to get that cosmic adventure, that fun quality. And it's not fun like comedy, like bad jokes, it's fun adventure. So that's what I personally feel they need to get a hold of, is grab that amazing scripting by Stan Lee and that fun cosmic adventure art by Jack Kirby and their cool storytelling techniques. Get that on film, then we'll finally get a Fantastic Four that's done right. Phase four, Marvel, what's up? <laughs> Robert, let's start with you. I just, I, I just, I want to give you a golf clap for that diatribe because right that on. was that was absolutely fantastic. You know, I, I was so excited. The Silver Surfer was one of my favorite characters when I was a kid. I mean, there was just something awe-inspiring about him, and that he was the herald of Galactus. So I remember having arguments, endless arguments, with the guy who lived across the street, Sean Flaherty, about who's the most powerful <laughs> character in the comic. It was always Silver Surfer. Like he could take <laughs> Superman, he could take mm -hmm. Hulk. And then he would, when he shows up, then Galactus would show up and eat your planet. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you gonna do? This movie utterly failed. It failed every childhood fantasy I had. It had every dream that I ever had about seeing the Silver Surfer and Galactus writ large on the big screen. It failed me on such a profound level that I walked out of the theater, literally, I felt like I'd been gut punched. Mm. And that it would, it would it, I felt like a Christian who's been waiting for the second coming his whole life, and then when I finally got it, disappointing. Damn, Chris Gore. Uh, the Fantastic Four is my gateway comic, and that I, I read the first 100 issues of the FF by Kirby and Lee, and that three issue arc, The Coming of Galactus, mm -hmm. I don't even think at that point I'd ever read a comic book that carried over into the next comic that was a multi-part series. It is one of the greatest stories in comic book history, those three totally. issues, and it's been, it's so influential to film that those three issues um, and that was uh, Fantastic Four is my gateway comic. It made me fall in love with comics and just buy the Fantastic Four through all sorts of different ru runs, you know, the John Byrne era and uh, among others. But but and that that particular story. So when I knew that they were going to make this and then Galactus was going to be a cloud, there were rumors at the time. I remember there were rumors early in the making of that 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to play Galactus in sort of a interpretation that was more closer to the comic, this sort of large purple That'd blue. Be cool. That sure. would have been pretty cool. Uh, but but we get the cloud yeah. um, and I, I, I don't believe that you can successfully and just looking also at modern films I don't think a digital effect is is a very effective villain I think we learned that in Star Trek the motion picture mm -hmm. as much as I love that film and it's uh, it's one of my favorites in, in Star Trek movies a cloud doesn't make a good villain I think the best Ghostbusters movie I saw this this year this summer was Suicide Squad. Mm. Also <laughs> sort of a cloud, mystical, yeah, yeah, spiritual yeah. Right. stuff that, that I, I don't like when those rules aren't, aren't explained. I mean, Galactus is a human. Galactus is a, a, a god, right? That doesn't care about about these insect humans, right? And they, they could have brought in the ultimate nullifier 
Remember, just like that. You, you need Stan Lee. I mean, the Watcher to show up. Yeah. Exactly. Like, you get that little click, the click, Watcher, click, click, I mean, just click, like, click. Yeah. like I, I, this movie was so profoundly disappointing. I was already disappointed in the first Fantastic Four movie because it just played it so base. And, yeah. and um, I do forgive Chris Evans for not uh, dyeing his hair blonde. <laughs> Twice I've had to forgive him for that. Yes. So, um, but but yeah, this 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 is one of the greatest stories in Marvel comic book history, and I hope one day we actually get to see it. I think if Phase Four, if they're able to bring in the Fantastic Four into the MCU, and then and then because I, I I actually think that we're going to lose some of these characters in Infinity War, the two part mm. Avenger. I, I really think that either Captain America or Tony Stark. It, is going to die. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I really believe that that yeah. that they're going to. It's and it's going to be an earned death, just like Spock's death in Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan is one of the greatest deaths in 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 movie and fiction history. That death, and then the death of Spock Prime in Star Trek Beyond. He basically gets a text message. Uh, right, right. Yes. I, I, I throw to to Rob for that. Although I have to say, the only thing that affected me in Star Trek Beyond was when you see that photograph from Star Trek. Yeah, everyone nice. got yeah. misty, and I know oh, you, you, you got, new Star Trek yeah. haters, you, you know you got all cry baby when that, I that got happened. All cry baby, I shed a tear. I know it was awesome. It was I like the Spock tear. from another universe crying for the Spock and the entire crew of another universe. You know, I just want to say real quick, you just yeah, remind yeah, me yeah, of something. Yeah. You know, we saw. There's a movie that came out in 1957 called Forbidden Planet with Walter Pidgeon. Awesome movie. Oh. Les, Leslie Nielsen, one of the great science fiction movies ever made. It's also the prototype for Star Trek. Theremin, totally using Amazing, it. with uh, one of the great robots of all time, Robbie. But the interior of the Krell lab mm -hmm. that we see in that movie Fantastic. is Jack Kirby. Totally. It is the oh, inside yeah. Oh, yeah. of right. Galactus' yeah. ship. And yeah. every time I watch Forbidden Planet, and I watch it quite a bit yeah. because it's great, <laughs> it you holds should all up. watch it. It, all, yeah. it holds up. People are like, it's old. It's yeah. awesome. It's also in color, all you people who are afraid of black and white films. Uh, awesome color with great Disney <laughs> animators working on it. But the Krell lab look, you can see what Galactus's realm should look like mm. in totally. that movie. Yes, I agree. I mean, I love Forbidden Planet. I was also, before we shoot over to Ashley, I want to also say that not only did they not take advantage of that three-issue arc, they also ruined the Do Doctor Doom stealing the Silver Surfer's power arc that came about ten issues later. Another three-issue run that, as a kid, that was my favorite series run because I love Doctor Doom, love the Silver Surfer, and then he's like, he tricked the Silver Surfer, one of the coolest and nicest guys, an alien who saved our planet and sacrificed himself. He's stealing his power so that he can rule the planet, like flying around on a surfboard. Come on, that's kind of corny, but kind of awesome. Ashley, what are your thoughts? So not only is this movie terrible, although Larry Fishburne as the <laughs> Silver Surfer is great, it baffles me when uh, Fantastic Four comics are terrible because all the good ones just ape those first 100 issues totally. anyway so just do that yeah. but then further to the movie we've had great star trek movies and fantastic four is just star trek with a family dynamic mm -hmm. so i don't understand why sony or marvel or fox or whoever owns it at the time doesn't just go like hey person who directed star trek movie that made money come over here and do this mm. story like and this to me too also illustrates the problem um, of you take a, a, a filmmaker who has one successful indie film under their belt and then you give them this giant property with a lot of baggage for fans and production studios attached to it and like that movie failed and it failed spectacularly in its adaptation, the 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 fan four stick, the latest one. Right. And both that movie and Rise of the Silver Surfer have great casting choices. Chris Evans is a great casting choice. Um, Ion Zeering or whatever your name is, I'm right. really sorry. I know, I know that's the wrong guy. Um, he's an excellent choice for Mr. Fantastic, yeah. but now, not right. ten years ago. So like, there's so, there's good things in there. Michael Chiklis is a good thing in there if you take him out of the rubber suit and mocap him. Mm -hmm. So it's it's disappointing too when there's elements like that that are shining through. And it still manages to be a giant poop. I was going to add. End. I was going to add Doug Jones, who played the physical yes. Silver Surfer, is also a great actor, and I felt bad that his dialogue was voiced over because it, it, we, we have that Hellboy. constant thing where it's like, yeah, it's like uh, it's a voiceover. You have to add a star. You're mm -hmm. like, no, that, that guy is actually a real actor, and I would love to have heard his voice as the Silver Surfer. Well, it, 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 oh, sorry, just qu real quick, interesting tidbit. Peyton Reed, of course, who directed Ant Man, mm -hmm. um, initially pitched a Fantastic Four oh, set really? in the 60s. To Marvel yeah. that was a period piece set in the 60s, sort of this Camelot, JFK era, early mm -hmm. 60s, which is oh, when so <laughs> when the Fantastic Four was born, 1961. 
It would have been brilliant. It would have been great to see that. But I think you and I have had discussion where I think Fantastic Four, maybe it's not a movie. Maybe Fantastic Four would make a better television series. Yeah. Or but or right? like, seen, a, like a Doctor yeah. Who like, mm -hmm. like I, adventures. I'm going to bring it up again. There has been a great Fantastic Four movie, and it was called The Incredible. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and, and you know, and, and, and Brad Bird directed that. Brad Bird also directed Mission Impossible: Ghost Protocol. He's right. now moved into live action. Why doesn't Marvel get Brad Bird? Right, yeah. he, gets, he works duty. for Pixar and Disney, so they got to be under the same contract. Someone should right. be calling Brad Bird right now. <laughs> I mean, I, he's probably working on the Fantastic Four movie, The Incredibles Two. <laughs> yeah. That's what he's working on right now. So. He's really close to the subject matter. And Maybe Iron Giant call. came out on Blu-ray, a special edition Blu-ray Iron Giant yesterday. is an, another amazing film. Let's get into Spotlight, and this week it is Howard the Duck. Now, we talked about the Howard <laughs> the Duck movie adaptation. Well, let's talk about the comic book. This week, uh, Howard the Duck was created by Steve Gerber and Val Myrick in 1973. Trapped in a world he never made, which was his quote, Howard and his human squeeze Beverly moved from social satires to fight characters like Dr. Bong, Bessie the Vampire Cow, and the Gingerbread Man. So the writer Steve Gerber went through many, many, many battles with Marvel over creator rights, as well as a lot of story plots. He didn't like having editors to like tell him what to do. Coming back and forth to the character, he'd quit, he'd get fired, he'd come back. Uh, over the many decades of uh, Howard the Duck's publications, a horrible film was made in 1986 <laughs> using George Lucas's name to help sell it, which had nothing to do with the comic book world created by Gerber. Uh, Disney later forced him to put on some pants via a, a really nasty lawsuit. They were like, look, this guy looks just like Davy Duck. We're coming at you unless he's changed change the look. They're like, we're changing the look. That's fine. And, and even later, the character bonds around for many years. Uh, Jack Kirby actually did a, a character called Destroyer Duck to help like help Steve Gerber in his battles about the character rights and stuff. He recently, now, now Howard the Duck recently showed up at the very end of Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, freed from one of the collector's glass prisons, looking pretty disheveled as a CG character. Uh, I thought he looked great. Uh, mm -hmm. Seth Green did his like one line or two little lines really quickly. I was like, man, if I'm going to see a Howard the Duck movie, I'm seeing that Howard the Duck movie. <laughs> Could Howard the Duck work now as either a limited television series or a feature film. Let's start with you, Ashley. Totally could. Also because with the Chip Zdarsky series, he's really popular right now. So capitalize on that popularity. Um, that original series too, you can find digitally. I recommend reading it, but not if you're going through like an emotional thing because it gets really meta. Mm. And that's one of the things that I think makes Howard special because once you get past the visual joke, sometimes an idea like that can fall apart. But I think because we've accepted things like Guardians of the Galaxy and Suicide Squad, which for superhero movies are like a little weirder, I think Howard the Duck would be a really easy fit into that. I would love to see it as a limited Netflix show. Yep. But again, I don't know what a Netflix budget is like, and this is going to be effects heavy because your lead is going to be <coughs> either mocap or straight up CG. Totally. So. I would I would love to see like you said a limited series that because it gets really existential mm -hmm. it gets really weird it's a satire within a satire it's a meta type of an idea that's what I'd like to see it go from actually it's an original uh, inception to what you're talking about now yeah. I think that works how about you Robert well you know I recently the I picked up the omnibus the hardcover omnibus and read Can you the imagine entire... that there's a Howard the Duck omnibus that exists oh and it's in great this world. I mean it's 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 a doorstop it's huge I think wow. it's all of the Steve Gerber all wow. of them. And it's great, and I read the whole thing straight through, and I was really surprised because I had sporadically read issues, but it is a very meta and very existential and very emotional series, which I was surprised by. But I think that I would love to see a Howard the Duck series in the Netflix MC Hell's Kitchen universe. Like him, mm. him sidling oh. up to Daredevil? Absolutely. Like, like, if you do it, they've already set up the milieu of, of post Chitari incursion in New York. <laughs> you know, that's where, that's where they're at, so why not? Why not have Howard the Duck like he he lived there in the seventies and he's come back to town and I think that's would be a great why not? You could make that work and it would be really interesting. I love you, Robert, but I would not want to see that. I love the Netflix <laughs> series with the way it is. I think a duck hanging out with Luke Cage could ruin it. Like the the, the subtle it blend just of like takes a very creative I creator. Know, I, know. I want Mike Coulter to be doing arm curls with. Him. <laughs> I don't. I, I would love to see a Howard the Duck series. I don't know about integrating it into the Netflix. Let's just get through the ninjas and Electra coming back to life mm -hmm. and some magic issues with the defenders and stuff. Then we'll see if the Howard the Duck works. But I agree with you. It as a series would work great, and I think it's it's the potential's there. How about you, Chris? 
course I want to see Howard the Duck. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think that's this is the thing that James Gunn talked about this in, in doing Guardians of the Galaxy because you have two major characters in that film that are digital. And his experience, actually, he, he, he talked about his experience doing Scooby-Doo creating, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a, a digital dog character in that in that film series like that helped inform him like how to do Guardian how to do Guardians of the Galaxy right. So I right. think like I think if James Gunn were involved with Howard the Duck, I think I think it could be pretty cool. So Howard yeah, the Duck cool. Beta Ray Bill crossover event. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When are yeah. they going to get some Beta <laughs> Ray Bill on this planet? <laughs> All right, Twitter questions, let's go. Statline asks, do you think do you think Red Skull, you've heard that the whole time. Sorry, guys. There's <laughs> dudes on the roof hammering away. They're trying to fix our roof. Um, do you think Red Skull will make a return to the MCU in any of the upcoming films? Let's start with you, Chris. Uh, I would love to see Red Skull in there because I just I, I like the fact that technically speaking, because of Captain America, the first Avenger, um, Hitler <laughs> is part of the MCU. Mm -hmm. So um, Red Skull, you, you, I, I think Red Skull coming back, I think... I, w I would love to see that because there's that there's that whole there's that one you know the Captain America animated series from the 60s mm -hmm. with the limited animation the Red Skull kind of reverberate reverberates you know uh, throughout Captain America's life and there's so many there, there's just I just think that's uh, an untold story like really technically did he die I don't, I don't think so he disappeared he at disappeared. the end and he was holding the cosmic cube let's not forget that the cosmic cube is like a story a storytelling device that's been used for the last 70 years in all of Marvel's entire history. Right. It's a great storytelling device. The Red Skull is holding it right now. I think he's gonna be in Marvel Infinity War. And like, I think he's gonna be fighting Ooh, nice. Thanos. That's what I think. And speaking of, I'm really happy to read recently that Thanos is gonna be an actual, uh, not a CG animated suit. They're gonna actually, they're making a fully fabricated outfit. So nice. he'll feel like a more blended I, character. If you if you actually look online, someone, I think it was some uh, Hollywood makeup school here. It's Ironhead Studios. It's Iron actually, Studios, yeah. it's a, it's a, a Fernandez, one of the great uh, special effects guys, Jose Fernandez, who that's his studio. And he built the X-Men, Magneto's, uh, Batman's armor for Batman. He's like, he's done every single superhero film and outfit. So if you're gonna have anybody build a physical suit, mm -hmm. That's the studio to get. Yeah, for no, sure. I, I love that because I just think you can only go so far with digital characters or clouds and whatnot. I think there's <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, I do think that, like, at, at a certain point, it's just like an actor is more effective. One of the yes. greatest villains in in film history is Ricardo Montalban as Khan. Yes, and I think that Star Trek's always the Star Trek films. I'm not just saying this because Rob is here. The Star Trek films, they've Star always, Trek sweaty. <laughs> um, you know, they've always tried to like we wanted do someone as good as Khan. They even brought Khan back. John Harrison, lame. Um, and they, they, you can't outdo that performance. I right. think you underestimate how great an actor's performance mm -hmm. can be. I mean, Loki, uh, I think, is exactly. probably the best villain in the, in the MCU. Yes. That's why he's right? the only one who doesn't die. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. But also, yeah. it's an actor in a costume, right. and it works. Robert? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I think that... Uh, it is the Infinity War, like you said. And the Infinity War insinuates that it's all of creation, all the multiverse. So how can you not bring Hugo Weaving back? Although I've heard Hugo Weaving has said he didn't want to come unequivocally, back. Unequivocally, he will not return to the role. And Marvel doesn't like to recast. But Yeah, but here's the thing. If it is the Red Skull and we don't see Hugo Weaving's face. It's true. I mean, maybe they can get him to do some dialogue. I don't know. Well, that'd be cool. But, but like you said, I mean, I agree with you, Chris. I think that we want to see faces. I think the best... CG character is still Gollum mm -hmm. in in oh, Two Towers yeah, yeah. because you really got a feeling and seeing the the before and after if you look at the special features on the the, the Blu-ray, you really get a sense that it is Andy Serkis that you're watching mm -hmm. and even when he does people like <laughs> Snoke, it's not the same. You need a right. director and an actor right. who really know how like James Gunn knows how to employ a CG character. Well, I think any of the new. <clears throat> with Andy Serkis, especially the new CG characters, you need the animation crew, you need the director, and you need someone like Andy Serkis. Well, he has his own so, studio now. Well, that's good because mm -hmm. he's he's at the forefront of this technology, and I think he's one of the greatest ones. How about you, Ashley? Um, I think that the Cosmic <clears throat> Cube idea is very interesting because in Ed Brubaker's 2005 Captain America that eventually led up to reintroducing the Winter Soldier, the Red Skull uh, recompiles the Cosmic Cube, and that's kind of what sets off all of those events. So that's something that we've seen in the comics before that I think would be fascinating to revisit. And if Hugo Weaving doesn't want to wear the mask, 
Just call up Andy Serkis and get the mocap. They worked on Lord of the Rings together. It'll be okay. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we're going to see the return of Yugo Weaving. And to touch on something earlier, you said like I don't think Steve Rogers, Chris Evans is not going to give up Captain America. He is going to do another four, five, and six. He is Captain America. That would be the worst career decision any actor can. It's like he can go off and do like three independent movies and return to some mega million box office mm-hmm. amazing phenomenon where everyone loves him because he he is. Steve Rogers. He, he is like the play, truest uh, form of that. He can play Old Man Cap now in the Dimension Z storyline. He can play Captain America forever as far yeah. as I'm concerned. I hope he does. Let's move on. Muhammad Hassan Ali asks, if MCU's Black Panther is going to use Storm, do you think they'll cast Halle Berry or Alexandra Ship from X-Men? Well, I'll start off with this one. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> number one, uh, Storm is currently, unfortunately, part of another uh, studio that the you know the character is owned by this other studio Fox and I don't think that the crossover is going to be happening so and if they did have Storm they would cast a totally different actress what do you think it uh, absolutely not and Halle Berry Storm is terrible so please God no mm-hmm. um, I think it would be way more interesting to develop the female Black Panther T'Challa's sister as opposed to retreading old ground that we've seen for six movies mm-hmm. now and Storm has never been a breakout lead of that franchise. So I think that the general populace is maybe not interested in her as much in in a more developed capacity. Um, I also think that you're never gonna get him away from Fox, <laughs> so. Right. Well, I think Storm, if they did a television series, would be an incredible, very strong female role if they did it right and they wrote it right. Yep. Robert? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that they're gonna, even if they could get Storm, I don't think they're going to put her in the Black Panther movie yet. I mean, they'll do, if anything, if they're going to have a love interest, it's going to be like Ant-Man. You know, you set up the Wasp as a strong female character first in one movie, <laughs> and then if they're going to have a relationship, we don't know what's going to happen in Ant-Man and the Wasp. But give it a... give give. Black Panther needs and deserves his own movie. There's a lot of mythology, too, in, in Wakanda and what that implies. Right. Totally. Chris? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, I agree with what you guys said. I mean, like, he's definitely, Storm is not going to be in Black Panther. But but um, I, I think uh, with regard to the X-Men franchise, I think they've gone as far as they can go with these movies. I think that the X-Men universe is so rich with characters and great storylines that it can only really be told in long-form storytelling. I don't know that movies are the best format. You know, it might not be the most profitable. I would love to see an ongoing X-Men television series where you could go off and do like a, a jubilee episode or like mm-hmm. explore these other you know minor um x-men characters i'd love to see like new mutants right i mean that that early the early I- issues of new mutants are just incredible the artwork is just bill sinkavich yeah, is just it's just insane so i think that what you could do with an ongoing x-men television series is just more exciting to me than a movie every three years just isn't enough i feel like they rush all this they're they're rushing all this stuff and you know with all due respect to Brian Singer I think he's gone as far as he can go with the franchise how about you Robert well I mean I I, look I agree with that as well I mean I think it's time to change it up Mm -hmm. a bit Mm -hmm. I mean we've seen uh, look as much as I love I do love Brian Singer's X-Men movies and I continue to love Apocalypse Uh, a lot of people don't Mm -hmm. I, I think the first half of Apocalypse is a terrific X Men film. Yeah, and the last half sucks. Well, the, I, I yeah, think you get the last a really half, cool fight. Yeah, you get a you get a world destroying villain. You don't understand really what he wants. That's or all what I'm his, saying is like the build is. up of X Men Apocalypse is fantastic, and I love the introduction to all those new X Men. I thought, wouldn't it be great to see all those new X Men? And then we have to watch like a dirt cloud of magnets and stuff. For, well, like, again, yeah, we go yeah, back yeah, to yeah, the yeah. old the old cloud. I know, I know, it's the old so, cloud. But uh, <laughs> Alex, what do you think about Storm? Let's get through that. Well, no, she's not going to be yeah. in. She won't be in the new <laughs> right on. I Black just, Panther movie. Let's, I don't want to, because we could talk about X-Men all day. Let's get to the next <laughs> question. Tahari asks, is Batman 89 the only time, only time a film has gotten the look of Gotham right? Let's start with you, Robert. Well, you know, I didn't like the look of Tim Burton's <laughs> Batman right. 89. I mean, as much as I liked I'm Anton, I, I yeah, love I Anton first as a production designer rest in peace he was great but I watched that film and I think what has made the MCU so successful is that we as audience members want to see superheroes interacting in this world right the world we live in we want to believe that if we look out a window and Superman flies by we want to see in the movies what that would look like Mm -hmm. because we want to imagine ourselves living in a world where there are superheroes the Tim Burton Batman I don't know where that took place it took place in some alternate universe where I had never been Mm -hmm. and and that kept that that until Christopher Nolan came and set it in a real American city, which I loved. I mean, I love seeing, 
well, right. Chicago, <laughs> Detroit, yeah, you know, yeah. wherever. <laughs> but, uh, but I think, though, the, the feel of it, it mm -hmm. felt like a real city. And while, look, I, I am not a big fan. I like Batman Returns a lot better than I like the first Batman. I think mm -hmm. it's very lethargically paced. Mm -hmm. You watch it now, and it's really, there's cool imagery in it, but, man, it's a slog. Um, but, yeah, anyway. How about you, Chris? 89 Batman is overrated. I'm sorry. The, the the best thing in that is Michael Keaton as Batman. Mm. But when you look at when you break it down from a story standpoint, the, the hero's journey is Jack Napier. Right. He's mm. the character that changes. You see the his origin. You don't see Batman's origin is told in a flashback as a throwaway at the end of the film. So I'm I'm as a huge Batman fan, I am not a fan of that movie. Mm. And I don't like the look of Gotham. I think Gotham looked best in The Dark Knight by Chris Nolan in Chicago. Go. Mm -hmm. So, because because as you pointed out, Rob, it's it sets us in the real world. So yeah, I disagree with the premise of that question to begin <laughs> with. I, I will argue both you guys and okay. also agree with both you guys. I love the premise of Batman in the real world in Chris Nolan, but I also love the premise of what Burton was trying to do with like getting that lyrical Bob Kane primitive art style and taking that to its full. And also even Frank Miller's his version of Gotham is what they were trying to go for. They were going for a meld of hyper real, non real. So that's what, I mean, I think Batman and even Batman Returns had that. Let's not, Schumacher went with the statues and a lot of even more over the top stuff. And that's why we needed to kind of like tear all that down and get back to what we got out of uh, Chris Nolan's Batman, which was a more realistic Batman. I agree, I like that Batman too, but I also like the Burton Batmans. How about you? Yeah, I don't love the watered down H.R. Geiger like Gotham City look. For me, the best Gotham City on film is, I, I don't think it's even on film, is uh, The Mask of the Phantasm because mm. it's the animated series, Batman, where it's like all animated on black yep. paper. It's the red sky. Like everything yes. about it uh, screams 1950s noir and everyone's wearing double breasted suits. Right. But we also have cell phones, so don't think about it too much. Like, I like that the DC cities exist a little bit outside of time, um, especially on film, but I understand that for a movie that you're making now, like for the current DCEU, you need to ground it in a city. Uh, Detroit, I think, is an interesting choice. I don't, I don't love the um, the sister cities that mm, they have going on right, with Gotham. That, with, and with Metropolis. Gotham. Yeah, it's weird to me. Um, but I also respectfully disagree with the premise of the question to begin with. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, I uh, let's move on to uh, Zandu <laughs> Trainer asks. Other than main Marvel or DC hero films, are there any films like Jonah Hex or The Spirit, etc., that could be done as a second chance? Like, do these characters deserve a second shot? I would say yes. I would say eventually someone will be able to get Eisner's The Spirit correct, and it'll happen, and people will dig it for what it's supposed to be, a crazy mystery satire. What are your thoughts? I think there's definitely room for every character that we have seen to have a great adaptation. You just have to get the right person to do it, and sometimes the right person can only adapt something great once, and it doesn't mean that they deserve to go and touch everything else. I think... Um, uh, Peter Jackson's a great a great version of that. He did a really good job on Lord of the Rings. He did a really terrible job on The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. I think Jonah Hex is a character that Legends of Tomorrow has a, done a great job rehabilitating, and I would like to see his buddy cop series with Booster Gold like the New 52, but more in a television form. And I think that's what's wrong with some of these movie characters like Fantastic Four we were talking about. They need a longer form storytelling. Totally. You can't condense everything down to two hours. It's really hard to. I mean, you, yeah. literally 90 minutes and you're out. Like We're used to like 10-hour epics. Like I need to know about the backstory of that side character you'll never get that in yeah. a movie what are your thoughts chris uh, i think some some deserve a fourth chance i'd like to see a good fantastic four movie <laughs> in my lifetime yes fourth time's the charm for fantastic four definitely how about you robert well i think we've seen as far as comic books go one of the great rehabilitations cinematically was uh, judge dread yes, yes. For because sure. you know you you saw the the first judge dread again it's all tone the first Judge Dredd has an incredible cast. Jurgen Prock now, I mean, you've got Armin DeSante. Totally. You've got Diane Lane, you've got Max von Sydow, but the tone of that film was all over the you've place. You've got Rob Schneider. Well, that's again, yeah, that's, that's a problem. Oh, yeah. It should have been RoboCop and it wasn't. You right. know, RoboCop had the perfect tone of Judge Dredd. But then when Carl Urban came and they, they made the 3D Judge Dredd with Lena Headley as the, the villainous. Alex Garland writing and was, producing. And the 3D in that film, that it's film, fantastic. because they nailed the tone. They brought back, I would love to see Judge Death. 
Mm. I want nice. to see the supernatural version of the Judge Dread characters in that milieu. In well, we have not given up on Carl Urban as no. Dread in a series. Come on, streaming services. What's wrong with Scott you? Those Netflix <laughs> um, I do want to point out Mask of the Phantasm is an incredible, another incredible animated feature film that DC did that is one of the best Batman films Oh yeah, ever made. So you got to check that out if you haven't. We'll cover it in an upcoming Heroes. Sweaty question of the week comes from Nart Sasaroqua. Whoa, I'm ruining your name. Sasaroqua uh, with a Q there, right? Um, over or under 50% the chance of Beta Ray Bill, you spelled it wrong, but I'm not going to kill you on that, being introduced in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 or Thor Ragnarok. Boy, would I love to see me some Beta Ray Bill. Now, I think Thor Ragnarok is the perfect place to introduce Beta Ray Bill on that battle world mm -hmm. that the Hulk and Thor are going to be on, and I think Thor can lose his hammer to Beta Ray Bill in nice. that in some sequence where he is, uh, you know, beaten and has to get a brand new hammer. What are your thoughts? I think there's just about a 50% chance of seeing him in one of those two movies, but I think it is going to be in a somewhat limited capacity. Mm. He's not going to team up with Thor in the right. long run. He's not going to be an integral part of the plot. If you wanted that for the character, I would say look to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because they've done some of the uh, less... I, want, I don't want to say sillier, but like less, not even, I don't know how to say it in a way that's not insulting, I'm really sorry. But some of the sillier characters, and they've managed to take them and incorporate them in meaningful storylines there, just because they're not as tied into right. like the tone of the MCU. Uh, but I would love to see him. I think I'm going to give it a 60% chance that he's going to show up in Thor Ragnarok, only because they're also covering the Surtur storyline. That's true. And that is where Beta Ray Bill is introduced. They have a battle. Thor changes. He loses his hair. We don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> he's wearing some like Braveheart outfit, you know. You know, we, if you haven't seen, unfortunately, a lot of people haven't seen the Hall H footage, which I did. So let me just tell you, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, you get to see a, chan a shot of Thor of Hulk jumping at a giant sized Surtur. And I was like, I thought I was going to die. So what are your thoughts, Chris? Uh, my thought 50 is 50 percent high. high is, uh, is he going to show up? If if uh, if I'm a betting man. I, I'm not good at betting. I think we've learned that. So uh, I'm not going to take a bet. But I, I think I think definitely he'll he'll be in it in uh, probably in Thor Ragnarok. Right. And like more like more so what Ashley is saying, yes. like maybe a smaller role. How about you, Robert? <laughs> I think absolutely. We're dealing you go with one hundred percent. I'm going one hundred percent. I'm going to make a bet. Thor Ragnarok <laughs> is uh, it, 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 Beta Ray Bill is one hundred percent going to be in Thor Ragnarok. Now I have not read the script. I don't know anything. This is a guess. I'm guessing, but look at where we're, look at the, the people that are making this movie. Right. First of all, the director of this film has a great sense of humor. Mm -hmm. If you've seen his New Zealand work, if you see what we do in the shadows, so it's good. it's one of the great vampire movies of all time, even though it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think his first, when he got the job, I'll bet you he asked, hey, can I put Beta Ray Bill in this movie? And they probably said, oh no, no, we got that covered. It's in this Right, it's already in this movie. <laughs> I agree with you. I'm going to go 99%. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to go that high. I'm going to say 83%. But I certainly hope Beta Ray Bill is in it. Let me thank everybody here, starting with you, Robert. Where can people find you online? Well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Star Trek. Right on. It's Star Trek's 50th birthday tomorrow in the United States. All right, Star Trek. September 8th, 1966. Or if you're a Canuck, it was September 6th in Canada mm, heck when yeah. the Man Trap first aired. So Bam. happy birthday, Star Trek. Yeah, Star Trek. Uh, it's been there for me my entire Entire life sometimes it's, it's been there better than at other times for sure and Robert you are a true blue Star Trek fan you're a, a giant library of awesome knowledge and uh, and you, you know it's been fun and so is Chris Gore so both of you guys it's really fun to have you on on the show right now for Star Trek's 50th anniversary I love the original series would watch it every every day it was on every day it was uh, on and it's at, amazing East Coast WGN I think it was at <laughs> six o'clock Star Trek you know we saw Bond celebrate its 50th anniversary mm -hmm. we have doctor who is 50 years old so these great venerable franchises these sweaty nerdy franchises that made us <laughs> that forged us who we are <laughs> yes today so trek. that's a great that's a great yeah. uh, it's a great birthday and there's been a lot of great star trek comics idw continues to publish great star trek comics pick them up but Definitely. you can find me uh on twitter at burnett rm or on instagram at rm burnett or on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. Right on. Chris Gore, where can people find you? Uh, what are you up to right well, now? Well, I, I want to echo what you said about Star Trek. I, I just wrote an article <laughs> for a website called waywardnerd.com, 50 ways to celebrate Star Trek's 50th anniversary. Mm. And it's just a list that I compiled of <laughs> cool Star Trek tours and events and, and stuff that you could do. And, and I hope you check out that article on waywardnerd.com. And also, I'm uh, running a Kickstarter campaign right now to bring back Film Threat. 
So you can go to filmthreat.com and the rewards we're offering DVDs, an exclusive t-shirt designed by Chris Parnaski mm -hmm. of Titmouse Animation Studios. And also some of the rewards are original art that were in old issues of Film Threat Magazine. So stuff that's worth way more than, than what the donation is. So I hope you go check it out at filmthreat.com and you can, so you can find me on Twitter and, and Instagram at that Chris Gore. And I'm, uh, I'm, imminently Googleable, mm -hmm. uh, but just uh, seriously, I really need the help. We're, we're actually doing well with the campaign. We're about a third of the way there with like, you know, two and a half weeks to go. So it looks like we'll make it this time. So check it out. And once we get to 50% funding, I'm going to release the trailer for the film threat documentary that um, a group of filmmakers have been working on for over a year. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. So I've seen thanks. it. It's, I've seen it. It's great. I fully support Chris and film threat. Film threat. Uh, I met Chris back in 1994 when I was showing uh, my uh, original comedy sci-fi film that I've never released, which you have to release. I am it. going it's to release so it. I'm releasing it next year. It's oh. called Mad Science, and Chris Gore saw it, and uh, we won he was one of the judges, and we won the very first year of the Chicago Underground Film Festival as best short film. I believe that's and that's how I met Chris Gore, and it was because he was a running Film Threat, and I was reading that magazine. So if you have never heard of Film Threat. Check it out. It's a, it's a, it was an incredible magazine. It turned into a digital thing. It's a, you know, filmthreat.com. It's an archival unit. And that's what he's trying to keep going is if just, like, if anything, if even if you're broke, put in five bucks. I think everybody watching this, put in five dollars and help get the uh, website so that it can main, be maintained. That's all he's trying to run. That's what he's trying to raise the money for is to simply maintain the archival unit of Film Threat and then move forward and maybe have some new reviews, have new, some new things. But that's what I think is the most important thing is a lot of people are like, I don't have 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Put in $10 and just help make Film Threats keep it alive. You know, if I could say something to that, the first review I ever received, I, I made a short film called The Sacred Fire with Peter Billingsley <laughs> from uh, A Christmas Story. Nice. And the Film Threat video guide was the first review I ever received for any of the work that I had ever done and it was it was hugely helpful to us as young filmmakers and uh, we were able to to parlay that review into another film it got us funding nice. that was it was because we were in film threat so bring it back young yeah. filmmakers support I think it's a, a very important thing so definitely go to filmthreat.com it'll it'll lead you to a Kickstarter chuck in 10 bucks Ashley where can people find you online and you've got a very special event happening this weekend with I perhaps do. somebody maybe you don't want to hear about that though yeah, you want to go hear. are okay. you kidding what, what sweaties everywhere you're their yeah. dream no. girl and this is the most romantic sweaty event it is uh, maybe is this it? year let, let's just i'll i'll so, jason inman who's also been on this show and ashley v robinson are tying the knot this weekend and we are very happy Ooh. for both of you thank you're you you're great great individually <laughs> you're great as a couple we think you both rock so we're very happy for both of you, and that's I didn't I didn't Aww. want to embarrass you on the show. We're not trying to. We're just saying <laughs> we think you're both awesome. And where can people find you online? Well, if you want to support both of us, you can check out our 30 part Star Trek web series at theredshirtdiaries.com. Nice. It's all completed. It's all up there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley V Robinson. And then if you want to support me and Jason again, uh, go to your local comic book store and pre-order the Alterna Comics If Anthology. We have a story in it called Terrific. It's the first story in the book, so you don't have to read anything else. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you guys. It's been a great panel. I'm John Schnepp. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And like I said, we'll be at the Long Beach Comic Con. We'll be at the uh, New York Comic Con in October. And then we'll be at Kamikaze back here in L.A. We're going East Coast, West Coast, East Coast, West Coast. We're going all over the place. We'll see you next week. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.